Hey you, I'm a Jordan B. Peter. Father of mine, tell me where have you been? So there is a certain gentleman who has been, uh, let's say, on rotation a little bit more lately. And of course, I am talking about Jordan B. Movie Peterson. Jordo Pepperton, Jorga Peepison. So Professor Peterson's press tour has been going on pretty publicly. <laughs> Ooh. He has an Amazon best-selling book, which is more important than a New York Times best-selling book because the New York Times editorial staff is hell-bent on destroying the institution uh, by, you know, hiring people like Brett Stevens. I oftentimes don't focus on specific people. I sometimes do, but only when they do something that sort of gives us an insight as to society. And Jordan Peterson, JP, the Jeep has done just that. Probably the most circulated clip of Jordan Peterson's is his interview on Channel 4, um, where the interviewer really didn't know what they were doing. They didn't really do the research on. They didn't understand what he was about. They didn't understand what he was doing. They were just trying to sort of get him with gotcha questions. And because he is operating on a level where he understands this sort of thing, he looked as if he beat the interviewer, so to speak. There are a number of videos on that interview itself saying how not to lose your cool. Some totally non-political YouTubers have had him on their shows. And he's talked about how he got her. He got her good. And um, I don't know that I would say he got her. I would say that she brought a knife to a gunfight. She wasn't prepared. I'm sure she's fine with other stuff, but for that particular interview, it was not good. She didn't know what she was getting into, and it was a bloodbath. Now, the first big mistake that media outlets have made with Jordan B. Peterson is that they think that his points are the point, and they're not. The way the Jeep manages to keep his right-wing ideology underneath the radar is a lack of conciseness of argument. He intentionally bloats his arguments with ancillary information that can either bore somebody who is waiting to get to the juicy stuff, or it can sort of give off an air of sympathy, but that sympathy turns out to be false. The points exist specifically to cater to a demographic. I'm gonna use a term from Chapo Trap House, not asking to like them, dislike them. I'm not asking for your opinion on them and I'm not giving you an opinion on them. They made up a term that I think works very well and that is the failson, which is essentially a young man or a young-ish man uh, who has not found their place in capitalism. And in so many words, they have failed to exist in capitalism. And uh, that is the person that Jordan B. Peterson is attempting to woo. Uh, the Failson is often looking for someone to blame because they have been told that they are extraordinary most of their life and it hasn't amounted to something. They haven't lived up to what they see as their potential. The world has either shortchanged them or everything they believe is a lie and they're not really sure where to go with it. Jordan B. Peterson offers this kind of person a scapegoat, a thing to blame. In fact, a lot of things to blame, some of them internal, some of them external. And the clips that I want to use to demonstrate his technique are the Channel 4 interview, uh, the recent Vice interview, and a video entitled Women at 30, which is the one I want to start on. In Women at 30, the Jeep asserts that women working at high paying jobs often realize that they want a family and kids, so they stop working 65 hours a week, which is mandatory in a big high paying job like lawyer. And he paints a picture about how capable women choose family and kids because family and kids require capable women. For example, I've worked very intensely with a large population of female lawyers, uh, usually usually partners at large law firms, very, very successful women, usually very attractive, very intelligent, extraordinarily conscientious, um, and the sort of people who were outstanding in high school and then outstanding as undergraduates and then aced law school and then did their articling perfectly and then um, became associates and then eventually entered the partner stream in a large law firm and then became partners. And a, a huge proportion of them wake up around 30, somewhere between 30 and 32, and notice their 65-hour days and the incredibly competitive environment that they happen to be in and the fact that the demands of their career are only going to accelerate as they move forward. I mean, they're going to make a lot of money, but the, the demands on their time of their career are only going to accelerate as they move forward and decide quite rapidly that that's maybe not what they want. And the reason for that is they also would like to have a life. They'd like to have a relationship that they could attend to and they'd like to have children. And the truth of the simple truth of the matter is, is that it's very, very difficult to have a truly high-end career and have an important relationship and have children, especially if there are two of you trying to pursue that at the same time. It's very difficult. And it's difficult to have a high-end career period. And it's also difficult to have a fully functional family. Trying to combine those sorts of things makes people who are, I mean, I've seen people do it, but man, they, they push themselves right to their limits. And 
they usually have limits that exceed the limits of typical people. Now you may have noticed an odd double standard here. He's talking about women saying that around 30 to 32, they realize that they want a family and kids and therefore they have to stop working. Women have to think about leaving work at 30, but men don't. Do you ever hear the term working dad? No, you don't because there's a double standard. He doesn't address this double standard. He just assumes that the listener doesn't notice it and moves on. So let's first talk about the fact that a woman in a high paying job automatically has significantly more resources available to her than a working class woman. And we're talking about making the choice to leave work at 30 to have a family, a child, etc., etc. So we're talking about a woman who is in a position to do this or close to in a position to do this. A high paid woman who is making the choice to leave work to become a mother is not very likely to be a single mother. At the working class level, all people are stressed out, overwhelmed. They don't have the ability to take time for themselves. It may just be that some accident happened. And as it turns out, a working class woman may end up having to raise children on her own as well as work. She may not have the choice. A woman choosing to leave a high paying job specifically for motherhood is very likely to have a spouse. That's not an assertion of who the spouse is anything like that, although I think he would uh, say it's a man, I'm not, uh, but a professional person who has spent over a decade accruing qualifications and getting to the position that they are in does not just suddenly go, eh, I want to live in a trailer and raise a kid on my own. Not a single word of this is discussed, though. He simply moves on to a totally unrelated section of material where we start to understand his methodology. Now, there's like a three or four minute thing where he says a bunch of stuff about simply like working hard and attempting to get into a, a position in life where you have yourself together and things like that. When I'm talking to young people and, you know, shaking my finger and saying, you know, grow the hell up and get mature and take on some responsibility. I'm not saying that because I'm an enemy of the person. I'm saying it because I'm the best friend of the part of them that would really like to walk in the light. And, and it's an invitation to walk in the light. And, and it would be remarkable. This is what we need to do as far as I'm concerned, not only in the West, but in the world at large, but maybe in the West first is we have to consciously decide that we're going to do everything we can as individuals to walk in the light. And the next point is that it's important to have children because you eventually get old. Being a highly creative woman, I find myself fearful that having kids will be spiritual suicide, hindering my endeavors, but I also don't want to have an unfulfilled life. Can I have a full life without kids? Well, yes, I, I suspect you can, although it's risky, Maddie, because it's really important for people to have kids because the thing is, is that you get older than 40 and our culture is kind of dopey in that regards. It's, it's underdeveloped. We live as if we live as if we, we only exist when we're young and we don't. It's like, what are you going to do from the ages of, say, 45 to 90 or 95? You, you need a family around you. You need to see your children grow. You need to have grandchildren. It's a major part, maybe the most important part of the last half of life. First off, apparently it is your children's responsibility to entertain you for the rest of your life, I guess. The idea that the clock is ticking is actually just kind of pressure on a woman to have children, to have a family and all that. And he's essentially just reinforcing that. And this is where we're going to divert from this clip for now. Now, in the Channel 4 interview, he says specifically that men have to sacrifice themselves most of their time and their ideas, their hours of labor, etc., to get to the top of the business hierarchy. There's a certain number of, of men, although not that many, who are perfectly willing to sacrifice virtually all of their life to the pursuit of a high-end career. So they'll work, these are men that are very intelligent, they're usually very, very conscientious, they're very driven, they're very high energy, they're very healthy, and they're willing to work 70 or 80 hours a week, non-stop, specialized at one thing to get to the top. This was his justification for the pay gap. To him, it's not that it is sexist, it is that there are a number of factors that puts men at an advantage. Now you may ask yourself, does he assert that this is because of biology or because of socialization? And it's important to note that he does not assert either of these things. This is again, a part of how he operates. Later in the Channel 4 interview, he says that Scandinavia has gone further than most societies in the pursuit of making women legally equal to men. And then he points out that in that country where free will has taken over legally, everyone is enabled to do exactly whatever it is they want. And I'm not going to argue whether that is true or false. I am simply stating what he is stating. In that situation, 
the ratio of female nurses to male nurses is extremely high with women and very low with men. He says 20 to 1, and then he walks it back saying maybe that's a bit extreme, perhaps remembering that it is not a YouTube video he is in, but instead an interview where he may be questioned on that number and, you know, doesn't want to be. Well, men and women won't sort themselves into the same categories if you leave them alone to do it off their own accord. I've already seen that in Scandinavia. It's 20 to so 1 female nurses to male, something like that, it might not be quite that extreme, and approximately the same male engineers to female engineers. And that's a consequence of the free choice of men and women in the societies that have gone farther than any other societies to make gender equality the purpose of the law. Those are ineradicable differences. Now he uses this as evidence to make the claim that women gravitate towards more agreeable jobs. There's a personality trait known as agreeableness. Agreeable people are compassionate and polite. And agreeable people get paid less than, dis than less agreeable people for the same job. Women are more agreeable than men. Again, a vast generalization. Some it's women are more agreeable than yes, men. Yes, that's true, but that's right. And some women get paid more than men. With agreeable, he means jobs like nursing, doctors, stuff in the medical profession where he claims that women excel in. This is his way of saying that women are caregivers. He maintains that this is just how it is, which to me makes the implication that it is biological. That means it can't possibly be in the socialization because socialization can be changed. And I think it's important to state that to you and I, perhaps biology is understandable as something that can be changed, but Jordan B. Peterson is not working within a framework that is acknowledging the ability to change biology, especially in, in a binary setting in which we're talking about what jobs a woman will choose as opposed to a man. He also references James Damore's memo, which is something that James Damore pointed out, for example, in his memo, which pretty much does the same thing, talks about how more agreeable jobs are what women are predisposed to go into, et cetera, et cetera. And neither James Damore or Jordan B. Peterson ever make the implication that it is worth attempting to change any socialization within our current society in order to pursue a situation in which women are actually on a level playing field due to their ability to act however it is that men act. It could be the case that if companies modified their behavior and became more feminine, that they would be successful. But you there's no evidence for it. I'm not neither doubtful nor non-doubtful. There's no evidence. So why not give it a go? As the radical because the evidence suggests, would say. well, it's fine. If, like if someone wants to start a company and make it more feminine and compassionate, let's say more feminine, compassionate, let's say, and caring in its overall orientation towards its workers and towards the marketplace, then that's a perfectly reasonable experiment to run. My point is that there is no evidence that those traits predict success in the workplace. And there's because it's never been tried. Well, that's not that's not really the case. Women have been in the workplace for what at least. Ever since I've been around, the representation of women in the workplace has been about 50%. So we've run the experiment for a fair, fairly reasonable period of time. So taking these two clips into account that women at the age of 30 somehow magically decide it's time to start a family and they need to leave their high paying job because they work too much and they want a life and they want kids. They can't have that for whatever reason. Wait a second. It may be that caring, sorry, I mean agreeable nature that they exhibit in the workplace. It may be the reason why they choose all of these caring jobs is because they're better suited for mothers they're doing just fine in medicine. In fact, there are far more female physicians than there are male physicians. There are, there are lots, of, uh, lots of disciplines that are absolutely dominated by women. Many, many disciplines, and they're doing great. In order to find the Jeep's point, we have to look at multiple instances of him talking because he will not actually outright state his point at any given time because either he knows that his point is controversial and will not be taken seriously and or he's not as smart as he thinks he is. Now, the Channel 4 interviewer does an atrocious job in this specific instance because she does not press him on that assertion in any way, shape or form, doesn't ask whether it is biological or socialized, because if she did, he would have to answer that. Now, that's not to say he ever actually answers questions that he's asked. He reframes the questions and then answers the question that he gave out. He literally like watched Zootopia and took the advice on press conferences. OK, press conference 101. You want to look smart, answer their question with your own question and then answer that question. And that's what I got from Zootopia. Now, the thing is, if he answered that it was socialization, it would unravel his arguments because these would be things that you could change. So now let's go into the makeup clip. In the makeup clip, the first assertion he makes is that he's not sure that men and women can work together. And the reason for this is that we don't know the rules. Here's a question. Can men and women work together in the workplace? Yes, I, how do, I you do it. How do you know? Because I work with a, a lot of women. Right. Well, it's been happening for, what, 40 years? 
and, and things are deteriorating very rapidly at the moment in terms of the relationships between men and women. And you Is there sexual what? harassment in the workplace? Yes. Should it stop? That'd be good. Will it? Well, not at the moment it won't because we don't know what the rules are. Now, if you saw it on Twitter, you probably saw it from Peter Norway's account, which before where Peter Norway cut the clip, however, he makes it very clear that he does in fact know the rules. Once you walk outside the gates of that university, that it seems very contained to the university. What I don't see is sort of this sort of veering towards apocalypse. Oh yeah, it's spreading. It's spreading into HR, into corporations throughout the US through HR departments very, very rapidly. In, in what ways though, in a way that is not sort of like, hey, well, how, NBC, about, you not, how NBC, about you not grab like the ass NBC of your NBC is regulating hugging. So that would mean to me that he is painfully aware of the rules. He finds the rules unfair. He thinks there's too many rules. So why then do we not know the rules? Does he mean something else by we don't know the rules? But here's the thing. These contradictory statements work in his point's favor because the idea is that men somehow aren't supposed to understand the intricacies of working with other people and not sexually harassing them. No, in the makeup clip, he obviously goes on to say some things about makeup that people didn't particularly like. Namingly, that the Jeep believes that women wear makeup specifically because, whether consciously or not, they know that it is sexually provocative. Here's a rule. Don't, don't How about no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Isn't that sexually provocative? No. It's not? No. Well, what is it then? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. Why? To, 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 I don't know why. Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. I mean, look. How about high heels? What, what, are they what about high heels? What about them? They're there to exaggerate sexual attractiveness. That's what high heels do. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't use sexual displays in the workplace. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that that is what they're doing. And that is what they're doing. But if the smart women leave work at 30 to start families, it stands to reason that the women that are there are only there to sexually provoke somebody into having children with them. There is an implication here that women's role in the workplace is to select and entice a man to get her pregnant so that he can spend all of his time getting to the tippy top of the business hierarchy and providing for them because that's what well put together men do. Now I do invite people to watch those three clips in their entirety. Um, I in fact very much want you to. It's about an hour of your time but you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. If you derive context from all three of them, you might be able to see what I'm saying about what he does. Now, in giving people self-help advice and individualistic encouragement allows people to sort of feel as though they're being empowered by this guy, while at the same time, he drip feeds them something to blame for why they're in the position they're in in the first place. His intent is to find alienated young and young-ish men who really just don't have anybody in life to set them on the right path within the current hierarchy and to give them some means of validation, which as we know, validation when coming from genuine sources is wonderful, but when it's coming from somebody who's attempting to extract value from you in some way, whether it be monetary or social value of some kind, validation's kind of skeevy. If you take the topic from several different places when he speaks on it, it puts together a picture that you can sort of start to derive what it is he might actually think on things. Putting all of that together, I believe he kind of views women as a necessary distraction to keep the species alive. Because women are not his main focus, and yet in these three clips he talks so much about women, it's interesting to think about the fact that his main audience is in fact young men. Why is he talking so much about women to these men? He does just enough not to sound explicitly sexist in any way, but the worldview you put together from what he says is one that is affected by a patriarchal hierarchy, which he is constantly acting as if we shouldn't be talking about, which is a clue as to what exactly it is that he's defending. And here's the thing, he talks so much about chaos and order. Now he favors order outright. He will say that without any contention, and it seems to me as if that is one of his goals, is to bring about order in a chaotic world. For him, it really seems as though that includes very specific roles for the very binary genders of men and women. And he says absolutely nothing at all that makes me believe that he believes 
these aren't ingrained biologically into men and women. On top of that, he attempts to present himself as sympathetic as well as throws in a bunch of ancillary information in order to perhaps bore you to tears. The lack of conciseness of argument acts as a means to induce fatigue. Plus, you have to watch multiple clips multiple instances of him speaking as you are attempting to find the part that is the actual point. But the thing is, you will not find the thing that is the actual point. You will find platitudes that tell you that all you have to do is get yourself together, young man. And then off to side, there are these little needling implications that women may actually kind of be the problem. But we need them because we need to have more children because the species needs to survive and they're the only ones that properly care for them because you, a man, have to spend all of your time, dedicate your labor to getting to the top of that hierarchy because that's what well put together men do you need to grow up young man Blech. it seems fairly obvious to me that his worldview is biased in favor of men and towards the idea that women are basically there for men it also again is incredibly cis heteronormative and that's not my bag baby it seems a lot that he has a very entitled upper middle class privileged position and that he is extolling the values of this position, his unquestioned position in the hierarchy, in which he is reaping the rewards of, by the way. Again, his book is the best-selling book on Amazon as of the recording of this video. His channel is immensely popular. He makes money off of that. And he has over 7,000 patrons on Patreon. And before he privatized the amount, he was making over $50,000 a month. There's no reason to believe that that hasn't gone up at least slightly in the time since he did that and now. He's not somebody who sees the underlying reason to question the systems that our society runs on. He's in a position where he believes the undermining of the system is the undermining of the Jeep. Jordan B. Peterson. Now, because media outlets believe that they need to be interviewing him, because again, for the millionth time on this channel, attention is currency in the marketplace of ideas, they can use him to get attention. That's essentially what any ad supported outlet or personality is trying to do. And none of them understand what he's doing. None of them understand that it doesn't really matter what his point is. It doesn't really matter what you're talking to him about. He is playing the long game not the short game. His short-term points are all self-help oriented and essentially sound empowering and naturally good. His long-term drip feed points are less savory. They give a scapegoat. They give you someone to blame for you not being able to take your proper place in the hierarchy, sir. To people who have actually observed the right wing's rise over the last five, 10 years, it's very obvious that's what he is. We've seen more than a few people who aren't willing to directly admit their viewpoints, but their dog whistles show off exactly what they're about. In fact, the country elected one of them. And he also kind of just outwardly admitted a lot of the bigoted stuff. So there's that. In fact, I'm pretty happy that he was not born in the United States of America because this is president material. Think about who is currently president. That was president material. And if you think about that, like, <laughs> oh, my Lord, the way that he's structured his act, so to speak, is that of avoidance of short form criticism. The only way you can actually criticize him is in the long form. I've done everything I can to make this as short as possible and is applicable to more of his content than just what I've shown here. And the reason for that is because this is not going to be useful if it's simply addressing one of his points. Now, certainly you do need to understand his point from these three clips on that specific topic in order to sort of unlock the whole thing. It's a validation machine to conservative and potentially conservative men who are looking for a reason that they haven't made it. He doesn't disrupt the current power structure in any way and sort of grooms young men to understand that he is there to help them be productive. So there's no real reason to expect that he'll get real pushback from any establishment source, including liberal sources. I mean, again, liberal news sources indulged Donald Trump just forever. They just let him do whatever, gave him everything. They were like, here, have as much time as you want. Just be you. The Jeep. Jordan Peterson is a profiteer who benefits the current hierarchy 
by re-socializing young men who didn't get it the first time around. These young men, like any other person who hasn't made it in the world, have a good reason to question the world. But Jordan B. Peterson redirects the desire to question, you can be productive if you only act this way, and you understand that these certain things are things to avoid, at least if you're not going to approach them from a certain perspective. And that perspective is that you work very hard, dedicate all your time, you find a wife who's willing to stay at home with your children, who maybe is very competent in business, but knows that it's smarter to leave and start a family, you provide her with absolutely everything that she could possibly need to raise perfect children and also bang your brains out because you think she's hot. Very successful women, usually very attractive, very intelligent. Do you remember the first thing he said about women who had made it in law firms and all that? The first thing he said was that they were attractive. And you got to know that that's what you're going for, man. 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 Now, here's the thing. I personally could tell you exactly how to slot yourself into the current power structures and hierarchies. I could do that. There's no reason for me not to either because it's apparently profitable. I could tell you that you need to deny yourself any questioning of your own identity, questioning of your own place in the world, any reasons why in fact you may feel alienation from the world. I could tell you that you don't need any of that. I could tell you that all you have to do is follow these simple steps, these 12 simple steps, and your star will rise in the hierarchy. And as long as you're willing not to ask me why, I would seem like a guru. You would come to me for everything, and I could charge you for that knowledge. And now you understand Jordan B. Peterson, a validation machine looking to carve out a demographic of people who are willing to pay him money to tell them they just need to work harder. And also these stupid women's liberation and equality things, that's just stuff that's in your way. You just need to work harder, man. Grow up and clean your room and put your shoulders back, man. Hello, it's Jordan B. Peterson here. Argument is split among instances of him speaking. Ancillary information is implanted into the argument to distract people who are looking for something to scrutinize. The general lack of any succinct points induces a fatigue, and he often tries to seed the narrative that he is in some way sympathetic and that it is in some way unfair that things are the way they are. It's possible to change them, but it's probably not going to happen because reasons. That's the extent of the given argument because nobody pushes him on whether he thinks it's biological or socialized, but that's missing the forest for the trees. So now, everybody who understands what I've said here uh, if you happen to work for an outlet somewhere, if you happen to do journalism, if you happen to interview Jordan B. Peterson at some point, this is what you need to take into consideration when you prepare. If you have to give this guy a platform, please confront him on what he is actually doing. Thank you. Now, I did what I could to make an aggregated, concise argument about exactly what it is Jordan B. Peterson is doing. Um, there's going to be stuff that was left out of here. I invite you, please put it into the comments. I will be moderating the comment section. So if anyone attempts to put anything shitty there, I am just, it's gonna be gone before anybody even sees it. So don't even try. Like is not a strong word. And if I have met that fairly low threshold, please do me a big favor and click the button labeled like. Looks like this, it does help out the video quite a bit. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more from my channel, please do me a big favor and click the subscribe button, it's down here. There's also a notification bell that pops up. Click that, you'll get notifications that it's the best way not to miss videos. Now, if you really love this series, as well as my other series, Very Important Documentaries and Adversaries, I would really appreciate it if you would consider becoming my patron at patreon.com slash petercoffin. I really have to thank all of my current patrons you make this possible because ads don't make this possible. A real quick plug of my book, Custom Reality and You. Here is the cover. Oh my gosh, that is actually a cool looking book. Now keep in mind, it's kind of a summary of all the things I talk about here on the channel. It's $3.49 on Kindle, $9.99 on paperback, and there will be an audiobook version that is coming later though. Now to everyone, patrons and non-patrons alike, thank you so much for watching Many Peters. I understand this was a bit of a long episode, but unfortunately, in order to actually address what we're talking about, it had to be. So um, please, please sleep well tonight and understand that you now have the power to stop. The G. Bye-bye.